good to go. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Whitcomb and I have the pleasure of chairing this seminar uh, of where Gay Skullthorpe is talking on Aboriginal collections from the Swan River Colony, Nature Methods and Motivations. And it's part of our Collecting the West series, which Al Patterson and I have the pleasure of co-leading as an ARC linkage scheme, looking at the history of collecting in WA from the late 1600s to now. Before I hand over to Gay, I very much want to acknowledge that we are, of course, all standing on Indigenous country that has never been ceded and to acknowledge elders past, present and future. And in my case, the elders of Wurundjeri country in Melbourne or Narn. And I know that you're all, all over the country. So um, there'll be many, many countries that we will be silently uh, acknowledging. Gay, over to you. I'm so pleased to, uh, that you're, you're kicking off in the detail of, of our findings in this series after Al and I kind of did a general introduction last week. So over to you to tell us about Aboriginal collections from the Swan River. Uh, thank you, Andrea, and good evening to everyone in Australia. I'm sorry for those who are still in ongoing lockdown. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Nyunga people of Southwest Western Australia. I'm very conscious that I'm not on Nyunga land and my talk today is in a way has a general aim of making collections from Nyunga land better known. So in honouring and respecting Nyunga elders, I hope that projects such as this enable these objects far away from their home uh, can be used by Nyunga people in the future to tell their own stories. So my paper today will largely be speaking about the white collectors who collected these objects and the institutions where they have ended up. So I'm going to be making some general introductory remarks, then talking principally about the collectors and collect collections. Then I will be speaking about some of the collecting institutions where the objects ended up and making a few words about comparison with other uh, colonies in Australia at the same time. So in, uh, just in relation to uh, a few more acknowledgements, very rarely does a paper uh, come out of nowhere. And this paper does draw on scholarship of other people and the research interests of other people. And some of those people include uh, Ian Coates's early work with the National Museum of Australia on Samuel Neil Talbot, and also Tiffany's ongoing work with collectors in the um, Southwest region of Western Australia and Rachel Hand's work on Irish collectors. And later on in the seminar series, we'll be hearing from Tiffany next week about the Indigenous collectors and also from Rachel more about the Irish connections that are really interesting. Um, in terms of the terminology, um, I, for the purposes of this paper, I'm re referring to the Swan River Colony generally is referring to the area between Perth and King George Sound. And I realise that's a very broad area and there are historical and cultural differences between them them, but for the purpose of this paper, that's the broad region and the objects from that region that I'm talking about. I'll also use the term collecting quite a lot, but I realise that that's a very general term and collecting can encompass many things. And as we'll see today and in other papers, um, it could be theft, exchange, a whole range of things. But I note that you know, it, it does mean different things in different situations. And often we rarely know how the collections and collecting was done, but in a few instances we do. Um, the period I'm talking about is from about 1830 to 1850, um, which is really, as Alastair defined it last week, the early colonial period of Perth and also King George Sound. But I think it's important to note that King George Sound, there were much earlier interactions 
with collectors before this period, notably with the people on um, Philip Parker King's um, voyages. And uh, at the end of this period, like from um, Tiffany will know better than me with um, from, it was probably the uh, Benedictines at New Norcia who began to make more systematic and larger collections. So the period 1830 to 1850s is um, uh, what I'll be focusing on here today. Um, the work does come out of um, prior work that I mentioned in Coates, but also the general work of this Collecting the West project. Also the other work I've been doing with colleagues at ANU on the Relational Museum uh, and its objects. And there's also other work that's happening, has happened here uh, at the British Museum through PhD scholars Daniel Simpson and his work on the Royal Navy and colonial collecting in Australia. And Nicola Froggart, who's just submitted her PhD on uh, Western Australian collections in Britain. And I'll mention that a bit more later. Um, I'm generally, in looking at what was happening here in um, Britain, um, I'm partly drawing on what Howard Morphy has sometimes referred to as understanding the two locals of collection, both the local Indigenous history where the objects were collected from, and also the uh, imperial histories that really tell the other side of the uh, story of what happened to these objects when they left Australia. And part of the general challenge in working with these two different locals in time and space is how do you begin to bring them together? And that's a question we might turn to towards the end of this paper. Um, it's interesting that um, uh, Nick Peterson in his book, The Makers and Making of Indigenous Australian Collections that um, Alastair referred to last week, he says, knowing the, collection, the context in which any collection was created the intellectual frameworks within which the collectors were working, the collecting practices, what they failed to collect and what Aboriginal people withheld is vital to understanding how any collection relates to the Aboriginal society from which it was derived. And he also, Peterson also notes from his analysis of the various collections and analyzed in his volume, which were mainly Australian collections, he says that there was no systematic collection of Aboriginal objects in Australia before the 1870s. But I think with the information that I'll present today about Samuel Neil Talbot in particular, I think this is really the first uh, systematic collection of any Aboriginal people's material culture um, in a collection. Uh, this is just, uh, uh, just the historical context so as I alluded to earlier, there was collecting, particularly at King George Sound um, before the period 1830 and um, Bedwall, King and Rowe, um, their collections did come back to Britain and were sold in the 1840s. But uh, the, it, uh, these three men, it's typical, I think that it's ine probably inevitable that most of the collectors we're talking about uh, are white British men but I'll also be talking about Englishmen and Irishmen as well, because I think there were some differences, but there was this legacy of collecting a King George sound that didn't really happen in the Perth region. Um, so turning to actually what was collected, this is, uh, and I'll just say that understanding what was collected is not really uh, an easy thing to understand because we can look at surviving museum collections, but that doesn't tell a complete picture. I've mainly been looking at collections in Britain, but I'm not really familiar with uh, the objects that are still in Western Australia or in other places. And also there are also many records of people collecting things and we don't know where the objects are. So you have to look at the archival sources different collections, but just from the perspective of Britain and what is surviving in collections, there were certain objects that we come across quite commonly, which is, you know, the codge and the tarp and a lot of spears. Um, generally though with the spears, although there are references to many spears, 
because of often museum storage systems, they're probably the hardest objects to see in a museum collection because they're normally stored in some very difficult to get at location or in a box somewhere. So that's a whole area to be explored. Then um, that the occasional object, shields, um, sorry, there shouldn't be spears twice, shields, boomerangs, grindstones, occasional objects, then rarely objects that perhaps are of more uh, organic materials, such as ornaments, a skin bag, and the honey gathering stick we'll see. And some objects uh, are no longer existing, like there was once a skin cloak. And at the British Museum, um, there are about 100 or 110 or so, 17 objects, probably from the Southwest, of a total of about 900 objects from uh, Western Australia in the British Museum collections. And uh, Nicola Froggart's thesis has a lot more detail about the detail of objects across Western Australia. And if we look at the sorts of collections who were collectors who were operating in colony at this time, you can see people of various different backgrounds. And some of these are overlapping. So the people of clerical faith or religious backgrounds, naval and military, administrative officials, um, the amateur gentleman, Talbot, as well as incidental collectors. So I'm just going to go through some of their collections. So this is Thomas Hobbes Scott. Um, so people, probably all the people in Perth will know this history very well, but um, uh, he actually visited Australia twice. Uh, first in 1819 to 1821 when he was in Sydney. And then later he got marooned off Perth in a ship. So he spent about a year at, uh, in the Perth region in 1829, uh, 30. And uh, Alastair showed a slide last week from uh, some geological specimens that he collected that are at the Natural History Museum. But the Pitt Rivers Museum acquired by the Ashmolean Museum, this one spear thrower, um, that came from Thomas Hobbes, Hobbes Scott, who was one of the you know, earliest ordained ministers of religion in the Swan River colony. So it's the only object from this region that I know that he collected or that exists in a collection. And then uh, another two other people who spent a brief time in the Perth region in 1838 were Backhouse and Walker as part of their long travels through the Antipodes, visiting um, Tasmania, coastal New South Wales, Moreton Bay. And they did spend some weeks in um, Western Australia. Uh, Backhouse came from a family of uh, horticulturalists and uh, uh, he was essentially a botanist. And uh, their journals of their travels um, have quite a lot of information about um, what they saw in the colony and the different people that they met. And it's interesting if you look while they're at, at, in the Swan River colony, they visited uh, King George Sound, Fremantle, Guildford, and uh, they met George Fletcher Moore, James Drummond, um, and uh, uh, they met an Aboriginal man who uh, told them about the big annual, what was described as an annual fair at King George the Sound, um, where the different tribes, as they said, came together to exchange lots of objects. But this is just one object from the, I think, Fremantle region that they collected in 1838, which is at the Pitt Rivers Museum. Um, the Reverend George King and Mrs. Jane King, they came to uh, also, they were Irish and they came to Perth in about 1841. Um, it's, I don't know where this spear throw is at left, but the British Museum has both these uh, objects in its collections. And the, it's the photograph of the spear thrower. We don't know where the spear throw is, but Interestingly, this spear thrower or this photograph of the spear thrower has two pieces of paper stuck on it, which are interesting because uh, what the handwritten uh, label says, uh, it seems to have an Aboriginal name for the object, which I can't decipher. And it says Western Australia. Aborigines gave this to the Reverend Dr. King in 1841, and then it was old. 
Um, so that was an, an example of supposedly a gift to the Reverend Dr. King. Um, and the other piece of paper stuck on the spear thrower is, I've worked out, is from Sydney Morning Herald from 1889, a report of the Linnaean Society that was um, describing the use, describing the gum used in making the spear thrower. And so the King spent a couple of years establishing like a, I think it was a school at Fremantle for Aboriginal children. And Bob Rees has written quite extensively about um, George King and Jane King. And Jane King also drew the original drawing uh, of which this is a print uh, that was originally published in the um, Society for the Propagation of the Gospel um, with the um, inscription that this tribe is now extinct. Um, so this is another example of the clergy collecting objects, but none of the clergy uh, in the early period at Swan Rear, the colony seemed to be making large collections, although Hobbes did make geological collections. Uh, this is, people probably know something more about Alexander Colley because his bi biography has been published and some of the objects collected by Colley traveled to uh, Albany in 2017 with a wonderful exhibition curated by um, uh, Manan Yungar people uh, and Western Australian Museum in the Yulman exhibition. And Colley uh, was a naval surgeon, but he later came back to live in Perth as a colonial surgeon and he collected objects and many, many uh, plant specimens. Um, as a naval surgeon, he donated his objects to Hasla Hospital Naval Museum at Gosport. Um, and it was in the 1850s that the Admiralty disposed of most of those collections to the British Museum. So they came to the British Museum in the 1850s. Uh, Collie, as many people know, had a close relationship with the Aboriginal man Makare. Um, and uh, one of the things he did wrote, he did write in a report to Governor Stirling in 1832. Uh, Collie suggested um, that Aboriginal people could be encouraged to visit the settlements, he said, at certain times of the year, um, and that their friendship could be developed through a, a full feast of tea, biscuit, rice, and such like, and donations of small tomahawks, knives, and blankets. Um, but he also commented, and this is, I think this is, uh, uh, really shows the autonomy of Nungau people. He, Collie also wrote, though, at any moment they can obtain the necessities of life in the wilds of their own country with less trouble than at the house of the settler. At that moment, they will be ready to desert those who may have been considering themselves as their protectors and benefactors without the ceremony of applying for permission to depart. Uh, John Picton Beat, he was in the colony for several years from the early 1830. Uh, he um, was uh, an assistant commissary and he, and with the, the military regiment, and he had been in Van Diemen's land uh, before arriving in the colony. He wasn't particularly well liked by his fellow um, colonial residents and he was sketched in the sketch you can see it right from the State Records Office of Western Australia, the, the sketchbook of um, H.M. Omani who depicts Captain Big as he is being very small at the right and as he thinks of himself at left. Um, he was from um, Wales, but he donated his small collection to Bristol Museum. And uh, it also included some spears, spear throwers, and some items of natural history. Uh, Captain William Henry Breton. He was a retired uh, naval captain and he published this book in uh, 1833 
after his travels uh, around Australia. And when he arrived in Fremantle in October 1829, he said every person was living either in a tent or a temporary hut. Um, uh, before he started his travels, he had been the founder president of the Launceston Mechanics Institute and also the police magistrate in Launceston and had collected human remains. And whilst he was in Western Australia in the Southwest, um, he did describe in his book about meeting the 21 Aboriginal people on the canning. And um, he did illustrate, as you can see here, uh, weapons from different parts of the colony uh, that he visited. And this is just one of the objects uh, that he collected, this knife that's in the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific um, Institution. So um, he did also collect objects from New South Wales, which are quite important. Uh, someone who a lot of people here will know very well is George Fletcher Moore, and he and George uh, Joseph Webb were both administrative uh, officials in the colony. Um, interestingly, um, I came across, you can see in the top right of the screen, an inscription made by Moore in uh, 1884, which is his handwritten inscription um, of him giving this book to the Earl of Derby. And he said, um, the inscription says, it includes about the year 1841, during a leave of absence, I had the honour of an interview with the Right Honourable Earl of Derby at the Colonial Office. The subjects introduced had reference chiefly to the state of the colony of Western Australia the colonies and the Aboriginal races. It is a singular and interesting coincidence that after the lapse of so many years, a pleasing opportunity should be afforded to me that I should still be enabled to avail myself of it, to present it to his son, another right honorable Earl of Derby, Secretary of State. Um, and the book bears strongly on the subjects alluded to above. So it's interesting how different copies of the book have different aspects and insights into um, the collecting practices. Um, it's, we know from George Fletcher Moore's uh, writings that he collected objects in a variety of ways and Tiffany may speak more about some of the Indigenous people uh, he engaged with um, next week, but just from looking at his um, uh, diary, you can see that even one person had different manners, different methods of collecting. So by punishment, breaking five spears belonging to someone. Uh, he said he purchased the barbed spear from Udemera. Um, he exchanged uh, a throwing board and gave in exchange a throwing board he had himself made from pieces of sword mahogany. Um, there was also a theft from a place where Aboriginal people were killed and he mentions a, um, a gift uh, given to him by uh, Weep. Um, he sketched some of the objects uh, he took after an inquest into a killing. And Tiffany brought this to my attention. And uh, you can see on the right, this unique object. It's a, a skin bag, probably kangaroo skin, that's in the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin. And if you look across to the sketch of objects uh, on the left, just over halfway across, you can see a little sketch that could potentially be this bag. We don't know, but it's like, you can just see above the word, um, if you can see the little pin above that, um, you can see um, an envelope shaped bag. And uh, Tiffany and uh, Shona Coyne have written about uh, this bag in a new book just published. And um, there's an interesting, uh, thank you, Tiff. Uh, and they've discussed this use as possibly being used for carrying uh, postal objects. So um, it's, a, it's just an amazing object. One of the interesting things about uh, Moore is in the descriptive vocabulary in the back of his book, uh, in giving names of Aboriginal words for objects such as a bag, he does provide um, detailed descriptions of two or three sentences of how they were used. For example, a particular bag um, called the goto, 
is the general receptacle for every article which the wife or husband may require or take a fancy to whatever its nature or condition may be. Fish just caught or dry bread, frogs, roots and wilkie are all there mingled together. And I think it's interesting that if you look at the um, these the vocabulary that Moore that Moore uses in his book, I think um, it suggests to me, and I'll talk about this shortly, that uh, in Samuel Neil Talbot's collection, he has descriptive, um, quite long descriptions of objects usages, and perhaps the connections between Talbot and Moore is uh, you know one reason to suggest that some of the objects that Moore collected may have ended up in Talbot's collection. Um, these some other objects in Dublin, which it has a fabulous collection of objects from Western Australia generally. Um, this is from Mrs. Jane Webb for Lower Mount Street, Dublin. So presumably George, um, oh, sorry, uh, Joseph Webb should, um, was sending these home to his mother and she donated them to the Royal Dublin Society. And I'm sure Rachel Hand will speak more about the Irish institutions. Uh, also, uh, Robert Neal, um, his collections are very spread out. He was also in Tasmania and drew uh, Aboriginal people, items of natural history, and his ethnographic collections that Shona Coyne and I visited are in Edinburgh. It's hard to identify them in the collections because often the early museum lists, such as at Wright, you might have a... Uh, a general day book of the museum, such as it's, you mightn't be able to read the information, but it has things like turned on the heating in the East Building and then received from um, Neil uh, Aboriginal objects from the inhabitants of Australia. So it's uh, really hard to track down individual objects, but the two feather ornaments there uh, given to them, the university collection seem to be the only ones they have. And of course he collected fish and drew fish and um, Tiffany and other people will be working with um, Manang Noongar people and other institutions going forward to uh, understand further about these objects. So that's very exciting. But uh, turning to Talbot, um, his collections are at the British Museum and uh, he, his, he came from, Malahide Castle in Dublin. His father was uh, Irish, his mother was English. His father worked as a diplomat during um, the war with uh, France. And then after 1803, his father retired as just basically a wealthy gentleman. And um, with uh, Samuel Talbot sort of growing up in that wealthy family, they lived from probably at least, I think about at least 10 years from about 1815 to about 1828 in France and then in Northern Italy. So place of rich uh, cultural collections. And then um, Samuel went back to uh, Britain and then decided to try his luck in various colonies. Some people in the family told uh, him he should go to uh, Canada, where his one uncle was, but he had another uncle, William, at Malahide in Van Diemen's Land. So he chose to go to Van Diemen's Land. And uh, he actually arrived in uh, Perth in 1829 with um, two servants and stayed for a while, about a year working in Perth, um, before then going on to Van Diemen's Land. Um, he's, um, while he was in Perth first, uh, he went to the uh, Canning River in October 1829 and he also travelled with John Septimus Rowe and Alexander Colley. He uh, acquired some lots of land in Perth and uh, then uh, for some years he went back and forth between Van Diemen's Land and the Swan um, River Colony and in um, 1838 he was back at uh, Guildford and having contact with George Fletcher Moore and others uh, in the colony then. Uh, his brother, James, um, he was a member of the um, Royal Archaeological Institute 
and a fellow of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of London. Uh, he became president of the Geological Societies of Ireland and vice president of the Royal Dublin Society. But I think um, even though it's a very strong Irish collections, Irish connections, when Talbot eventually came back to England in the early 1840s, um, he, uh, oh, he sent his objects to the British Museum, I think because of his mother's uh, uh, connections. He inherited his uncle William's properties in Van Diemen's land, but he seems to have had some mental health problems and uh, he spent the last years of his life uh, living with these problems in um, uh, London and wasn't able to uh, take over the management of the properties in Van Diemen's land. But in terms of his interest in the objects, um, he did say um, in the Book of Presents that the British Museum says how he first sent eight spears, five paddles and an axe from the settlement at Swan River and its uh, neighbourhood. And I think the paddles, people were often confused because about what spear throwers were. And I think both in the Sydney region and in Western Australia, spear throwers were sometimes referred to as um, paddles. Um, so he did give some objects, first of all, in 1832. And then in 1838, he, he wrote to the British Museum saying, having lately visited the Swan River Colony, I was enabled to make a very good collection, um, taking the liberty to forward them to the museum, hope it will not be considered intrusive in my part, and that even such a trifle may not be considered unworthy of being placed in that valuable establishment. I'm very happy at the same time to state I found the settlement to be in a flourishing condition and likely in a very few years to be of being a valuable appendage to the mother country. But um, he really, in his notes, he did say he tried to make a systematic collection and for, for the objects that he did give, there, you know, there are descriptive um, descriptions of the objects of how they were uh, used. So he, I'm not sure if he observed all these himself or if he had discussions with people like George Fletcher Moore, but there are about a total of um, 70 objects in the collection. There are many spears. There once was a cloak. Um, uh, I'm just gonna show a couple of them here. Uh, a digging stick. There aren't generally many women's objects in collections, but that is one. Uh, this honey gathering stick, which he described as a long rod used for the purpose of gathering yellow flowers from the banksia. And this sack of red ochre. Um, and that's an interesting uh, object too. Could that also have been one of the sacks of uh, uh, ochre that was referred to in Moore's diary? We don't know, but... Um, it's the, he, he was, he took quite some effort to actually write descriptions of the objects, send them to the museum. And as we'll note, late, late, note later, um, it, it was quite expensive to send objects back, but uh, with a total of 70 objects, he was the um, largest collection collector that we have from this region at that time. I'm now going to turn quickly to some of the incidental collectors, people who only collected a few objects. Um, looking quickly at um, Sergeant Rose, Charles Brown, Baron von Hugel and the Reverend Liths. Um, and also, uh, I don't have images of them, but occasionally you have references such as in the University of Aberdeen, they have a couple of interesting objects. One is a bark, which to me looks like paper bark, which says a specimen of bark used for covering wigwams. And then um, another object they have from the Swan River that says implement of wood used for beating beef to make it tender. So there's no idea um, who gave those, but they're obviously early objects from the Swan River colony. Um, this is uh, a Royal Engineer, Sergeant Rose. Uh, he gave this objects 
through to a Dr. J James Jardine, who passed them on to the uh, Dumfries Museum. And that was neatly written up and drawn in the museum catalogue. A boomerang of Corley from Swan River, Australia, brought by Sergeant Rose R.E., presented by Dr. James Jardine, 1863. It says, the wood when bored has the odour of violet. And that's the only object from the Swan River Colony in the Dumfries Museum. Uh, just another early object from Swan River Colony, Charles Brown. He had a, a huge um, uh, uh, nursery of plants in, uh, on the Swan River, selling uh, and growing all sorts of um, fruit trees, um, an enormous list. He was, must have been very interested in uh, horticulture. And um, he sent this to the Norwich Castle Museum. And uh, in the 1950s, Norwich Castle Museum got rid of most of its ethnographic collections and sold them to World Museum Liverpool, who were trying to build up their collections at a time when they had been destroyed. Most of them had been destroyed um, after during the war. So often the, it is the case that objects are given to one museum, they can be transferred to another and the records don't always move with the object. So it's quite lucky when it's not a good practice, but when original labels are stuck on the objects and they still survive, it does help in identifying them. Um, this is at uh, uh, Cambridge. Uh, I don't I don't think this is from the Swan River because I haven't seen any references to uh, reed necklaces being used in the southwest of Western Australia. They don't appear to be in any illustrations. Um, and he may have collected these um, Baron von Hugel when he was on the east coast of Australia. But um, uh, he arrived uh, in Perth in November, 89, in November 1833 and wrote that um, the entire country was a picture of nature untouched by man. Seems remarkable when we uh, read that now. And he did note that um, scarcely any information on the Aborigines has found its way to Europe. Um, he, and in his writings and his diary, he, he, um, he met John Septimus Rowe and uh, he described various Aboriginal objects that he saw. Uh, possum hair string belts, kangaroo nose bones, women with cloaks. Um, he said, these poor unhappy creatures inspired profound pity in me. But um, it's, you know, I haven't found actual objects that we know he collected from the Swamp River Colony. This is a, a mystery object. So all opinions are welcome on this one. Um, I know Nicola uh, was trying to find out further information this was also donated by Norwich Castle Museum to Norwich Castle Museum in 1834 by the Reverend George Reading Leith, who was a, a large collector and a botanist from um, Norfolk. And it was the Norwich Castle Museum record said it was uh, from King George Sound, New Holland. And um, I've never seen anything like it before. I know in the Georgian period, uh, tobacco and snuff boxes in the shape of frogs were being made in England and that um, snuff boxes were being imported for sale into Perth because no one was making snuff boxes in Perth. So could this have been made by someone at King George Sound by a European colonist? Um, but then how could it have got to Norwich and to Reverend Leeds? His wife had the name Barker, one of her long names, but whether it's a link to Colet Barker, we haven't teased that out. But also the Reverend Leeds, um, he was acquiring objects from all over the place from as early as at least 1806 7, because he was in, um, um, in correspondence with people like William Hooker at uh, uh, Kew Gardens. So if he was collecting objects early, could it have come from Western Australia at an earlier period? Really don't know, but, and this is pure conjecture. Um, uh, 
I've been looking with my uh, colleague Daniel Simpson at some of the early catalogues of sales of objects from New Holland uh, that are in various London libraries. And one of those uh, uh, sale catalogues for Colonel Robson in 1807 lists objects he obtained from the South Seas, which includes a box in the shape of a toad. Could this be a box in the shape of a toad? I really don't know. But then if it was 1807, um, how could he have got that? Um, the Laverian Museum sale also had in its sale of 1806, a curiously formed box, a war weapon and a basaltic edge from King George Sound. Now also there's a um, uh, King George Sound in um, Canada. Could there have been some confusion or could somehow um, George Vancouver have one of his men made this? Could it have gone back through St Helena where Colonel Robson was exchanging objects? I don't know. Um, or could it have been inquired by Leeds much later? But it's one of these mystery objects that I think is absolutely intriguing. So any insights on that would be very welcome. Um, just quickly, some of the institutional uh, interests. Um, I've been talking mainly about what was happening in the colony, but you have to understand what was happening in the institutions in Britain, um, the state of these institutions and what they were interested in. For example, um, during this time, the British Museum wasn't particularly interested in ethnographic objects. And Adrian Kepler in her studies of Pacific objects um, describes uh, the early South Seas objects at the British Museum from 1800 to the 1830s. She said, she described um, the objects from South Seas as artifacts in search of a category. So they didn't have a category apart from artificial curiosities. And the artificial curiosities in 1807 were described as the vilest trash in the basement. So the emphasis really at the British Museum was on natural history and there weren't many people interested in what we might call ethnographic objects. And so it's, and at the same time, uh, Haslar Hospital Naval Museum, which had been established in 1827, that was a well-organized museum um, with good naval attention to detail. And many objects went to the Haslar. And in fact, as uh, Danny Simpson writes about in his book on the Royal Navy and colonial collecting, there was an inquiry into the British Museum in 1835 because it was then seen as the very poor cousin of Haslar Hospital Museum. So that things that uh, the British Museum in the 1830s received, apart from the donation from Tolbert, it received several objects from Major Mitchell in New South Wales and very little else. Um, and then there were the old universities um, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, St Andrews, and they acquired a few objects and then the Irish institutions that um, Rachel will speak about. And the 1830s was this incredible growth of literary and philosophical societies in many towns and people donated to things to those societies, which were often later transferred to museums. And um, for people sending objects back, they had to navigate the customs house and pay substantial tax. So uh, you did need to have quite a bit of money to send um, these objects back to Britain. Um, just to give you a few images of some of the institutions, um, bottom left is um, an image a photograph of Hasler Hospital Naval Museum. Um, the dispensary above the United Service Museum, which Philip Parker King gave objects to in about 1831. The bottom one is St Andrew's Museum, where uh, Reverend Moody gave objects uh, in 1843. I think he was the founding, uh, the founder of the St Andrew's Literary and Philosophical um, Institute and um, the British Museum. Just in relation to um, the Irish institutions, um, the Belfast Natural History Museum was very active in the 1830s. 
and they received objects from Victoria. Um, there was the Royal Dublin Society and Trinity College. Um, they also were slowly developing collections, but it was interesting that um, uh, William, Makes, uh, Make, William Makepeace Thackeray, uh, under the pseudonym of Mr. M.A. Titmarsh, travelled round Ireland um, and uh, he wrote a book called The Irish Sketchbook and the extracts from this being published in the Perth Gazette in 1843. And so, and in it, he described um, Trinity College and what you could see if you visited Trinity College in Dublin. And he said, if the collection is worth preserving, and indeed the mineralogical specimens look quite as awful as those in the British Museum, one thing is clear, the rooms are worth sweeping. The place would have been a disgrace to Don Saltero. Now, if you're like me and you're thinking, who is Don Saltero? Um, I didn't know this. He had this famous coffee house and museum in London in the early 1870s that was also functioned as a museum. And at the left is a, um, a print of the building of his coffee house. And it's actually signed by various people who visited the coffee house from um, uh, 1723 and includes the signature, the Pan Sloan. So it was this, you know, long London uh, tradition of people having collections um, and the unsystematic collections and the slow growth and more systematic of British institutions. Uh, just a few comments to finish off with. Um, it's interesting about what was happening in Western Australia. If you look at other colonies, um, if, for example, in New South Wales, there was no systematic collection, but there was a lot of individual collecting. And it was the first fleet surgeons who were collecting things. And a bit later on from the Hunter River uh, region, Lady Parry, the AA company, uh, Charles Wilton, uh, he was collecting a whole range of material. In the 1840s, George French Angus was collecting material in the Sydney region and in South Australia. And in the Port Phillip district in the 1830s and 40s, there was George Augustus Robinson, who made quite a large collection. And then John Lewis von Stieglitz and the surveyor, surveyor John Wedge, um, their collections were sent back and Lieutenant Governor Charles Latrobe, who sent ethnographic objects to Switzerland. And uh, maybe you wonder, you know, did any of the early Lieutenant Governors of Western Australia collect any objects and where were they? And you know, did any of the other pastoral landowners in the southwestern of Western Australia make their own collections and what happened to their collections? So just to conclude, uh, in terms of the nature of collections, um, Mainly, you see many of a few object types, like the codge, the tarp, the spear throwers, few organic objects. The methods that were used were often assisted by Indigenous people, and you'll hear from Tiffany next week. They were acquired by punishment, exchange, purchase and theft. Apart from Talbot, the collections weren't systematic, and they were often came from a range of uh, networked individuals. So you can't always be sure who actually collected them first because I'm sure they exchanged objects because there are records of that and came from those types of backgrounds. And so some people had clearly interest in botany and natural history like Collie and Robert Neal. Moore was interested in Aboriginal um, language. Talbot was perhaps inspired by the enlightenment idea of having collections. And um, the collections that survive do reflect the motivations of the institutions here, such as uh, Hasler Hospital for the Training for Naval Surgeons, the British Museum, which mainly at this time was natural history. And yet, you know, as we know, there were few institutions in Western Australia, although the Mechanics Institute was starting. Um, if you want to read more about these, the Tiffany and Shona's um, article in the new book, that's great reading. There'll be the Collecting the West book. Uh, Rachel Hand will be having a book being published with the National Museum of Ireland uh, about the Irish collections. And Nicola Froggart has submitted um, her PhD on colonial ambitions and collecting in Western Australian frontiers, uh, waiting for her examination.
And so just some general questions, you know, could further studies of these objects understand the diversity of material culture within the Southwest region? What were the differences in collecting between the Perth region and Albany? Um, that's a bit hard to tease out because few objects have very precise provenances. How do these collections compare with what is in Australia? And how can these uh, collections be mobilised for the benefit of Noongar and other people? Thank you. Thanks very much, Gay. That was just a fantastic survey and wonderful objects to look at. So I'd really like to open it up for questions. We've got some time. Ross Chadwick, this is, I'm remembering the Hassel collection at the WA Museum that comes from Albany. And I think that could possibly be an interesting collection to put in conversation with Gay's history here, because it has, as far as I understand, it has possibly connections to Tasmania as well. Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't actually. Um, this, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, I remember I, being being in the museum when it was all out on the table. Um, and, the, the same as the Layman Wanner up, or is it something different? No, it's something different. So the hassles were. Uh, Al, you might know some because you were there with me when when we saw a beautiful Tasmanian um, shell necklace. Remember, laid yeah, out on on the table at the WA Museum. And there was a whole collection of Aboriginal items. But it, it sounded like the Hassels were a family that came from Tasmania to Albany before Swan River Colony as such was established. And so there's that kind of whole sealer connection, Gay, and, uh, and then items from King George's Sound as well. Maybe, maybe the research hasn't been done yet. I think that that material and it's wonderful vagaries of all these museum collections, but my understanding is that went to the history uh, collection rather. So, it, but it does have that material, which I think Gay's seen from Tasmania as well. And I, it, it's a nice example. And I really enjoyed Gay's talk for highlighting the ways in which, you know, even though we're focused particularly on Western Australia, there are a lot of these early collectors that are kind of, you know, flitting across the, you know, the archipelago of colonies and, uh, and collecting here and there for very similar reasons. So it's fascinating to start to think about, you know, these, you know, what the purpose of these collections and what they're really doing um, by collecting from all of the colonies. Mm. There's a question, someone had their hand up. I can. Oh, sorry, there's some um, chat. Sorry, I should be looking at the chat. Um, <laughs> Linda, you said, I think this is about that box, um, Gay. It looks like there's a lizard mounting a frog or toad on the, I think, Linda, you're referring to, um, to that box, aren't you? Linda, you're on mute. Even, even more interesting, is, is that frog decorated with poker work dots? Uh, it seems to have a burnt design on it. Yeah. Very Which, interesting. Because it's so fine, seems to suggest that it's probably done with metal rather than... Yeah, with stick. wire. Mm. Mm. Um, Gay, just... Okay. Sorry. Oh, oh sorry, Russ. Sorry. Just reflecting back on your list of common and occasional and rare, um, Codge particularly seems to be quite prominent in all those early collections um, over things like boomerangs. Which, of course, boomerangs in museum collections, particularly after sort of the 1890s, probably seem to be quite commonplace. I'm just curious if you could reflect on whether people were targeting particular things that they might have seen from early ex exploration accounts, I'm thinking of Philip Parker King's um, illustrations of both spear throws and, and a codge from King George Sound. Just, I just wonder whether there was a, a particular kit or a, a souvenir type of object that people were targeting when they were collecting early on, or whether it's just that people were carrying them that were more obvious in terms of the things that they were uh, making and um, using or exchanging. Uh, yeah, it's a bit hard to say. I think it's true though, something has been illustrated, like in King's um, narrative of his voyage, people who came to Perth later would probably have read that because um, people always read what 
the last person, last traveler or voyager um, wrote. But I think in some ways the Codge have survived perhaps because they are quite uh, robust um, with being of stone. But it's interesting, there don't appear to be you know, uh, as many um, boomerangs from the southwest, but they are quite a lot, lot of the knives. So, um, yes, how well, if that reflects people's knowledge of what is from that region or what people were using, yeah, it, it, I find that quite a hard question to answer, but it's, it's a good one to think about. Oh, that's fine. That's, yeah, that's good. I, I just wonder whether it reflects both the visibility of objects and possibly the nature of them as well. So whether boomerangs were in common usage or whether our trade items with no shields were necessarily made in Perth area or further south, but were traded in. Um, so yeah, potentially the things that they were giving up were the things they had easy access to materials and could make more readily. And the things like boomerangs and shields were perhaps more special and not, not given over that easily. Yeah that, that, yeah, that could well be true because people often say that the shields were traded in, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Rachel, you, sorry, I didn't see your hand up first, first to go. go. <laughs> No worries. Oh, thanks, Guy. That was that was absolutely fascinating to see the breadth of that collecting going on. And I think there's an awful lot more that we can tease out about the connections between the collectors out in in Swan River region. I know, uh, especially that you were talking about near Neil Talbot, Samuel Neil Talbot, and, and Moore and stuff. And I know they went riding together. Moore's journals are really handy for that. But I don't know if there's any more elsewhere because um, there's a fascinating sort of note in I think one of the I think it's the might be the Western news, newspapers that um, they call them the uh, sort of the Irish boys and things and Talbot Webb and uh, Moore are singing Irish songs for St Patrick's Day and they're all getting together and having an absolute jolly um, and I think like you, you're saying about the connections between that bag from Webb and whether that it was actually connected by Moore I think it's really possible that they're sort of doing a lot of swapping and exchanging and I think it's been going to be really interesting to see how sort of these stories develop as, as all this research goes on and, and we're now we're tying it all together it's fascinating so thank you for that thank you and for the shameless plug <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, you know, in one of your last slides, Gay, you had a um, question around sort of local uh, colonists collecting. And I think we do have examples of that. So the Lehman family was definitely one. Uh, and those objects would still be, I think, are still in the family from memory. But they collected, you know, how the Lehman family settled in that Bustleton district. But the, the objects that they had in their house in the southwest were actually objects from the northwest. So it's like they're collecting as the frontier is advancing and it's the next generation that is collecting. And then it gets displayed in a kind of homestead. So there's, there's a history to unpack there as well, I think. Yes, there's lots of scope for further work on all these collections, um, particularly in Western Australia and um, as well as at this end. Yeah. Al? Yeah, I had a question. I mean, Gay, you obviously touched upon the opportunity with certain of these um, collections in that we understand a little bit more from, for instance, Fletcher Moore about um, the various ways in which he obtained collections. Um, but, I, you know, it's one of the things I think that surprised me is how, you know, we know these collections are created, but we have very little information captured about the ways in which, you know, people made those connections, the types of interactions were made, particularly with Aboriginal people, obviously. Um, just that, because you've done this survey, you know, how often is it, do you think that you get a sense of the ways in which collections were actually constituted, whether they were, you know, found or exchanged or is that, you know, just a kind of, even a percentage value and some of the kind of the, uh, the ways in which that's been captured? Well, I think it's a pretty low percentage from um, the earlier times, but then it really depends on um, 
archival research as well. So while the objects, you might know an object is collecting by someone, rarely does the museum um, have the details. So what we've been finding with the work I'm doing with people at La Perouse and Maria Nugent in relation to the early Sydney objects and with, um, with Daniel Simpson working with me on the archival aspects of that, um, there are all sorts of libraries and sources that if you go back and read again, there are particular, sometimes particular episodes where something was collected. And so you get a tantalizing insight about a collection of something, but to find that object in a collection, if you go from the collecting reference to the, you can't always find it in a museum. So the whole um, sort of, um, difficulty is you have an object in a museum and you don't have the records but you come across a record and you don't know where the object is so trying to make those connections is sort of part of the ongoing challenge in researching all these early objects. It certainly is, thanks. Mm. Which then is an argument about where do you um, or is a question about how you once you've made those connections how do you ensure those connections are there for posterity. So this is kind of collection documentation stuff, isn't it? But it's also digital ways of representing these connections and the, how we interpret, interpret them. Uh, yes, and I think it's so important that um, when you start digging into the, this work, often you come across people who have done work on these collections, maybe some decades ago, but um, it might be in an obscure paper. Yeah. Um, it's not easily available on the intranet and uh, for uh, the larger museums that do have public databases, it's really important that we continue to work on adding information to those to make it easier for the people who come after us. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're, at well, five, we're after five o'clock. It's amazing how quickly that happens. Five o'clock for you, seven for Eastern Staters, 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. for gays and, and others in the UK. So I think it's probably time to close. But Gay, thank you so much for a fascinating paper and for that trip um, of, uh, around WA objects in, in the United Kingdom. And thank you everybody for your questions and for coming. Next week, we do have a continuation of our story because we've got Tiff Shalom talking. Tiff, do you want to explain your talk next next week? Um, no, um, I, yeah, so indigenous collectors, but I still have to, to finesse it a little bit. So yeah. But yeah, no, it, was, it was a great talk tonight, Gay. I really, really enjoyed that. It's really great to see those objects and those connections. I think Rachel's comment about the connections between the collectors was just, yeah, really fascinating about that in situ connection. Um, it'd be worth thinking about that a bit more, I think. It's great. Yeah. These are all things we can unpack, continue to unpack, aren't they? So anyway, hope those in the UK have a wonderful day and I hope WA people have a lovely evening and to my colleagues here in Melbourne and in the eastern state yeah hope it's not too wild and wet where you are <laughs> and have a good evening we'll see you next week I hope <laughs>